Good morning and welcome to the worship service of First United Methodist Church in Plant City, Florida. I want to welcome you to our online worship service. Please stay tuned for a short song to help us really open our hearts to the Spirit of God. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and enjoy worship. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for him. Since you were going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have.
is here to set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Today, as we enter our time of pastoral prayer, I would remind you that we have prayer cards at all three entrances. If you fill one out and turn it in, we'll be more than happy to share it with our church family, as well as with our prayer chain. Please keep these particular needs in mind this week. Laverne Mwibinge is having a heart catheterization on Monday, the 21st. Also, his daughter, Christine Tomsick, is having thyroid surgery later in the week in Chicago. Continue to pray for Gary Norman and his continued recovery, Delana and the family of little Noah, and then pray for Lisa Nickel, who has been in the hospital for several days now. Pray for her complete recovery. Let's now go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are a nation in crisis. Lord, it seems that Satan has just unleashed every weapon to break us. Today, the entire West Coast is burning. People are dying. Entire communities are incinerated. Lives are being changed forever. Meanwhile, in the eastern part of our country, entire communities have been destroyed by hurricane force winds or flooded by rising waters. People are dying. 
lives are being changed forever. God, bring comfort to these people who reach out now and, and just don't know where to turn. Bless their lives. Let them see where you are apart. God, you told us through the Apostle Paul that whatever happens to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And Lord, we aren't doing a very good job of that. We tend to yield to, oh, to whatever philosophy or ism sounds good to us at the time. Paul emphasizes the importance of unity of spirit, and yet we have allowed ourselves to be divided and in constant conflict. Lord, bless Pastor Stephen's message today that it may awaken us and draw us together to stand united. People across our land are coming together out of tragedy. Inspire us today that we may come together out of Christian love. Let us begin by praying the prayer you taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Jonah 3, verse 10 through 4, verse 11. When God saw what they did and how they turned their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them and did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled Tarshish at the beginning. 
For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, is it better for me to die than to live? But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Bless this reading and pastor's message. There's a pastor, and he was taking part in a local charity golf tournament. As he prepared to tee off, large storm clouds began to gather and roll in. The organizer of the tournament uh, pointed them out to the pastor and said, Preacher, I trust you'll see that this weather won't ruin it for us. Pastor shook his head and said, Sorry, I'm in sales, not management. Well, I think so many of the Old Testament stories, we really don't want to look too closely at them. For instance, the story of Noah the Ark is really a dark, and terrifying tale about the destruction of all living things save those on the ark. So what do we do to avoid its implications? We turn it into a child's toy. We make it basically a fun and happy children's story so we can keep it at arm's length. The story of Jonah is another one of those stories we mostly relegate to children. The only aspect of the story we focus on or even remember is that Jonah was swallowed by a whale or a big fish and spent three days in its belly. Really, do you know much more about the story of Jonah than that? Well, over after this morning, you will know more. So what's the lesson of Jonah? For some reason, being devoured and then regurgitated by a huge fish is more memorable than the point of the whole story. It's a small book. It's only four chapters long. Actually, you just heard the entire fourth chapter read to you. You could finish reading the whole book before the sermon is even over. You can wonder why the folks who compiled the Bible decided that this odd and curious little book was deemed important enough to include in the Bible. I'll share something with you that you may find yourself needing in some future game of Bible trivia. Jonah is the only book of the Bible that ends in a question. Well, before we look at that final chapter in our passage this morning, let's get a quick overview of the story. Jonah was a prophet during the reign of King Jeroboam, who ruled over Israel from 793 B.C. to 753 B.C. This is a very old story. Jonah was a contemporary of the prophet Amos. As a prophet, I can understand that Jonah is very unhappy, to say the least, that he's not being sent by God to speak to his own people, God is sending him to the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. The ruins of Nineveh lie on the outskirts of the city of Mosul in modern-day Iraq, on the banks of the Tigris River. Nineveh was the largest city in the world for several decades until a civil war in Assyria saw it sacked. Much later, it became the seat of a Christian bishop. It declined during the Middle Ages and was mostly abandoned by the 13th century. Well, there's your history lesson for today. Did you know that Jonah was one of only four Old Testament prophets that Jesus mentions by name during his earthly ministry? But Jonah is just not mentioned by Jesus. Jesus actually identifies himself with Jonah's three-day journey in the belly of the whale, alluding to his own death when he would spend three days in the heart of the earth. 
before his resurrection. In the Gospel of Matthew we read, Jesus answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. So to the people Jesus was speaking to, the story of Jonah would have been very familiar. They knew the story. They knew all the Old Testament stories by heart. Fragments of the book of Jonah were among the writings found in what we now call the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, back to the story. Of course, if you are familiar enough with the story, Jonah decides that he wants no part of preaching to what is, in essence, the enemy of Israel. So Jonah hightails it out of there. He flees to Joppa, a port city on the Mediterranean Sea, about 40 miles northeast of Jerusalem. It's still a thriving city today. Its modern name is Joppa. He pays the fare to get on a boat headed to Tarshish. Do you know where Tarshish is? It's located on the coast of modern-day Spain. Jonah is so dead set on not accepting this mission from God that he is heading to one of the farthest points in the known world. I'm getting as far away as I possibly can. Maybe God will then decide I'm not worth the effort and send someone else. Of course, if God has decided he wants to use you for a task, you might as well accept it. The story makes it abundantly clear. You can't run away from God. So a huge storm blows up, and the sailors realize this is no ordinary storm. So what do they do? They cast lots. They basically roll the dice or draw straws to see who gets the short end of the stick, so to speak. It was a common way back then to try to reveal the will of God. So guess what? Tag, you're it, Jonah. And Jonah admits that he's the cause of the storm and all the trouble. He said, it's on me, my bad. So he tells them to throw him overboard and the storm will cease and they will be saved. Well, even back then, it's not good business to throw a paying customer overboard. I'm sure he paid a pretty penny to be taken all the way to Tarshish. So at first the crew refuses and keeps on sailing through the storm, but they eventually are forced to throw him overboard. How badly do you not want to do what God is asking you to do, that you want to be thrown, thrown overboard in a storm? As a result, the storm calms and the sailors then offer sacrifices to God. Jonah is saved by being swallowed by a large fish or whale, and he spends three days, three nights in his belly. Well, Jonah inside, he prays to God. Chapter two is the whole prayer. He cries out to God and ends the prayer by basically saying, okay, okay, I'll do it. The last line of the prayer, Jonah says, what I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. So the whale spits him out on the beach and he heads off to Nineveh to fulfill his mission. He tells them, in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, lo and behold, People of Nineveh, they listen and they repent. It says in chapter 3, the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. The king sends out a decree. In it, he declares, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. It says when God saw that they did what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. What a great way to end the story, right? Well, not for Jonah. And this brings us to our scripture this morning. Jonah is ticked off that the city is saved. He wanted them to be destroyed. He, in essence, tells God, why did I have to leave home for this? I knew you were good and gracious. I knew you would show compassion. In our passage, Jonah, Jonah says, this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. 
It's kind of like this horrible city I hate has been saved by me. I can't live with that. So Jonah literally goes off and sulks. He builds a little shelter and waits to see if God might actually end up destroying the city. He really is pouting and throwing a little temper tantrum because he didn't get his way. Well, here's where the story gets a little curious. But I think God is making a point to Jonah and to us. God calls us a plant to grow over Jonah's shelter to give him some shade from the sun. But the next day, God calls us a worm to bite the plant's root and it dies. Jonah is now exposed to the brutal sun and heat. He becomes faint and pleads, pleads with God to just kill him. Now God begins to bring home this point to Jonah and hopefully we can learn something today. Now there's actually quite a bit of humor in the Bible. We tend to miss it much of the time because we're reading Holy Scripture. It's serious business. But listen to this little exchange. It said, but God said to Noah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I was dead. Jonah is throwing a childish little tantrum with God. God tells Jonah, you are worried about this vine that was giving you shade? You didn't plant it? You didn't tend it? You didn't make it grow? You are more concerned about the stupid little plant that is here today and gone tomorrow than you are about a great city of 120,000 souls that were going to perish. Jonah, get your priorities straight. And to be honest, how many times have you made a mountain out of a molehill? How many times upon reflection have you thought, I really overreacted there? I let my emotions get the best of me. I sulked. I threw a little tantrum. I made a much bigger deal out of something that it needed to be, and a wave of embarrassment washes over you. For some of us, that happens on a daily basis. The book ends with God telling Jonah, And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left hand, also many animals? God's even concerned about the animals. So what do we make of this little book tucked away in the Old Testament? If you remember last week, Jesus challenged Peter and us with his words about radical forgiveness, forgiving 70 times 7 if need be. Well, this is actually a story about forgiveness as well. The overwhelming mercy and compassion of God to forgive an entire city held up against the petty, mean spirit of Jonah, who does not rejoice that 120,000 people were saved. Now, if you notice, Jonah is not running from God out of fear of what he's called to do. Jonah's not afraid. He's running because he knows how loving and how compassionate God really is. And he knows what's going to happen if Nineveh listens to him. See, the Israelites have felt their brutal hand of the Assyrian Empire. Jonah has no love for them. He wants no part of their salvation. Verse 2, he says, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah wants Nineveh to be destroyed. Jonah flees from God because his resentment toward the Assyrians overshadows his obedience to God. I mentioned it last week. But I think deep down, we like the scripture that says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Retributive justice makes sense to us. Did you know the Old Testament verse Jesus refers to is actually a much longer verse. It comes out of the book of Exodus. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Those Assyrians, they've been horrible to Israel. Let them get what they deserve. Revenge and payback can seem a fair thing to do. When we've been hurt or wounded or riled up in anger, it's easy to go there. We push that repeat button and play back the offense over and over and over in our minds. Thank goodness God is a lot bigger than us. 
God is gracious. God is compassionate. God is slow to anger. God is abounding in love. The God who is ready to forgive, forgets. God even forgives Jonah of his hatred and pettiness. He could have let him be thrown over the boat and be done with him and use someone else. God forgave Jonah. It says the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. It's like, okay, Jonah, I'm going to ask you this again. I still want to use you. God is giving Jonah a second chance to say yes. Well, this time he agrees, maybe reluctantly, but he's willing to follow the direction of God. Now, he doesn't let Jonah off the hook too easily. He has to let Jonah, Jonah has to think about it for three days in the belly of the whale. He has to stew on it, ruminate on it, pray to God. I'm sure all of us have had to spend time in the belly of the whale for God to do some work on each and every one of us. Do you ever find yourself fighting with God? You want to do one thing, but you know God is pulling you in another direction. I was actually the exception in seminary. I went straight to seminary right out of college. Almost the entire student body was made up of people who were going into ministry later in life. They would tell you that they wrestled with God, resisted the call to ministry, sometimes for years, tried to fill up that void with other pursuits. They delayed, they avoided. They boarded their own ship to Tarshish in order to get out of it. But eventually, they could no longer say no to the call of God in their life. Many of them left solid careers, uprooted families to follow where God was leading them. I think we all need to spend time in the belly of the whale at some point in our life. If you are going to be a mature and authentic follower of Jesus, you almost have to have a season of your life where you wrestle, you question, you want to run away. We all need to do that hard work of transformation. You have to go through it to come out on the other side. In many places, the Bible speaks of the refiner's fire. You are put into the fire to burn off those base materials in order to come out as pure silver or gold. Proverbs 17.3 reads, The crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. Job says, But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Zechariah declares, and I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. Julian of Norwich is a saint from the 13th century. She wrote the first book in English ever written by a woman. She understood that all of us, in essence, have to spend time in the belly of the whale, have that transformative experience. This may sound counterintuitive, but only when we fall or go down into the depths do we really learn almost everything we need to know about spirituality. You face contradictions, doubts, uncertainties. You wrestle with your mistakes and your failings. Julian said, first the fall, and then the recovery from the fall, and both are the mercy of God. God was gracious to Nineveh. God was gracious to Jonah. God is gracious to you, to me. Therefore, me, we must be gracious to each other. Each of us has a Nineveh in our lives. You may have many Ninevehs you struggle with. Who are you angry at? Who do you resent? Who do you secretly hope that God is not gracious to? Are you trying to book passage on a ship to get you out of facing them? Or heaven forbid, God wants you to minister to them? We all have a Nineveh in our life, if we're honest. The prophet Micah asked, who is a God like you, pardoning inequity and passing over transgression? 
God does not retain his anger forever because he delights in showing mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. God is with us even at our worst. And that is good news for all of us today. Amen. upon you. 